Delightful to be with you on this Tuesday the 8th. Good morning and welcome to the town meeting program, our local talk show, which is brought to you by our local provider of cell phones and wireless data service. That would be Cordova Wireless Communications. Bayview Communications, Cordova Wireless Communications. I'm seeing symbiosis here, and fortunately they do too, so we can bring you this program. And it's a fascinating one today. Because however, how often have you thought, I would like to be able to go and enjoy this particular scenic spot and be one with nature and enjoy being outside, but I don't want to be rained on the whole time. Well, apparently that's something people have been thinking for quite a while. And fortunately, the Cordova Trail and Covered Spaces Project is working to address that. And we're going to learn all about it today and what they have in mind and how you can participate to help make it a reality. Because if you choose to, for example, make a financial contribution, it's another one of these situations like with the Cordova Center where the dollars that you contribute get leveraged into grants that actually will provide the bulk of the funding. We just kind of need to do the seed funding here. So we'll learn about the timeline, and there is sort of a deadline coming up at the end of the month. We'll learn about that. And our guests, by the way, Natasha Cassiano and Dottie Whitman, longtime Cordovans both, and both with a great appreciation of what the outdoors has to offer. So stay with us for the next half hour or so and learn about the Cordova Trail and Covered Spaces Project with Natasha and Dottie on today's Town Meeting Talk Show. So, Dottie, let's start with you here now, um, and wondering if you could kind of give a, a history of how this this idea of the Cordova Trail and Covered Spaces Project came about. What's the background? Well, um, and last, um, I think that just looking back in time, I think that there's a lot of people that even though this has a specific starting time, I think there's a lot of people who have felt throughout the years that wanting there to be more places to be in our weather and in our environment. And so uh, I think the idea for it, there's probably a lot of people that thought that that would be a great idea to have more covered spaces. But specifically with this project and the, the, its inception started last year in um April when we had um, Max Romy was uh, coming to town and we uh, had an opportunity for him. He was showing a a film and there was a a chance for the funds that were going to be generated from him coming. And he is a, and he's an artist, but he's an outdoor journalist. And so he also does a lot of, uh, out his his work takes him outdoors and and so we thought that it would be neat if it had something that had some connection with uh with the outdoors so uh we thought oh it would be really neat if there was something that we could use the money that's collected for having him being able to show his films where would those funds go mm. and so um i think it just sort of became a brainstorm i think um natasha and I were talking and uh, and thought about how, well, let's think about, wouldn't it be nice if we could start a project where we would be able to have some spots where we could be to be able to do all these different types of activities in a, a wide range of them, whether it's, it's um, uh, viewing natural history or uh, being with friends or doing drawing on the outdoors, painting outdoors, that you could be that would have a covered uh, covered space to it. And as that developed, that concept of that, of, of maybe um, creating these spots that would also be connected by a trail similar to something like the Appalachia Trail or, mm-hmm. you know, some of these trails that people, the Pacific Crest Trail, but it's kind of a mini trail that would take them through uh, Cordova and they could connect and people could bike to each one and it could, there could be this, these uh, 
things that were connecting one another. And suddenly she disappeared. Okay, well, we'll wait and see if we can get Dottie back. Um, Natasha, so uh, I'm kind of getting the sense that there are, uh, they, these are a bunch of different sites that can be enjoyed individually or that uh, people could go to kind of in a series and make an extended experience out of it. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's exactly what the vision is. And as Dottie said, this idea of more covered spaces around Cordova is not a new idea. I was able to look back at some of the records um, in the city and there were some covered spaces here and there were covered spaces that were planned that just didn't get built. Mm. We used to have a few around town that have gone away and we've noticed that it's really something that is needed here in Cordoba so people can get outside when the weather is rainy or or just not so great and get under a covered space. And by connecting them with the Cordoba Trail, it does create like a wider experience so that there's sort of a network of covered spaces that could happen where you could go from one to another if you chose to do some kind of a, an adventure. And um, the trail is, the idea of the trail is really from Orca Bay to Hartney Bay with a spur out Power Creek. And so in along that trail, which is really the existing roadways that we already have, different spaces could be placed so that people could enjoy the route. Is this something that you would expect would appeal to visitors as well as locals? Is, is, is the, the visitor component part of the planning or is it really more designed for for locals to enjoy predominantly? Both. Uh, Really, the quality of life in Cordova is really important to everyone that lives here. And then also one of the things that I've noticed when I have family members or visitors come, that's one of the things that we want to do is go find a space where maybe we could have a picnic and enjoy being outdoors with a larger group. And um, not not meaning a huge group, but, you know, maybe five or six or 10 people sure. where you could actually get under a covered space. And the one that is used the most is out at 22 Mile, which is pretty far away from town. And so by being able to have some closer to town, these opportunities will arise for people to spend more time outdoors. And yes, it will be good for both community members, families who come to visit fishing people who come to town in the summer times and during the fishing season, and then also visitors who come to town. So pretty much everybody could benefit. Sure, sure. Well, and, and, you know, the idea, for example, some of these people that have been coming in on the ships, you know, to have a way to walk through and get a sense of of what the town is about in at least an introductory way, um, that certainly would seem to be a possibility. Uh, what are some of the spaces right now that are that are being considered? Uh, are they kind of all over or concentrated in town? If people would like to get more information about the project, the easiest way to do it is at visitcordovalaska.org. And, and there's a link for Cordova Covered Spaces under that site. So it's visitcordovalaska.org and click on the Covered Spaces link. The first site that we expect to be able to have built, we're, hope, we're working with the city right now to build a site at the Breakwater Trailhead in 2024. And um, right now there's a lot of work going on in order to get prepared for that. So that'll be the first one that we'll be able to build. And if, you, if people want to look at the map of where other spaces are proposed, they can find that information on that site. Okay, so uh, it's is it it's, so this I get the sense this is still kind of in the beginning phases. Then there hasn't been any construction or, or anything yet. It's it's largely in the planning process. It is at this point, yes. And we're also fundraising. We've mm -hmm. got several fundraising. Um, we've done several fundraising events, and we're doing more. And yes, so we're we've been doing quite a bit of um, effort to raise funds for these sites. Okay. Uh, Dottie, we, good, nice to have you back with us. Uh, sorry we lost you there for a sec. I was asking Natasha a little bit about the appeal for 
locals versus visitors. Well, not versus, but, you know, uh, so do you see that also? I mean, because you've, you've had, through the Shorebird Festival and other things you're doing with your shop, a lot of connection with people who come in from out of town. Do you see good potential for, for people coming to visit the town as well as those who live here? Um, I, I, I really think for the, this project is something that would appeal to a wide range. It would be a great spot for visitors as well as, you know, family that has family visiting and places that people can meet, but also um, I, I, I was off for there for a minute, but just also the intersection of, uh, natural history, indigenous history, and, uh, and and art it has a lot of potential for different types of 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 attraction to to locals and visitors alike you know mm-hmm. it could be something that be, would be that where people could come and then you know bike the whole um the length of it or walk the length of it and to do it over several days and then have at each station you know different spots where they could be painting or drawing or viewing wildlife or learning about our history and um so i Mm -hmm. i feel like both visitors uh that are you know not from here but also people from here could benefit from this project yeah well and just uh, again can more opportunities to be able to enjoy being outside without having to be pummeled by weather is is certainly going to be plus Again, the website that Natasha gave out, uh, visitcordovaalaska.org, would have some details on proposed sites. Do I remember that right, Natasha? If that that uh, if people go there, they should get an idea. They'd be able to get an idea of where all the different locations might be. Yes, yes. Uh, click on Cordova Covered Spaces link at the top of the page, and there's a map, and there's also a timeline of the history of the project there, and. Um, some of the fundraising um, efforts that we're doing are listed there. Um, that site was created, we created it at Cordova Gear mm. a while ago because we kept getting the same questions over and over again from our customers. And so we started creating a site where they could go to get some of their questions answered. Yeah. And it also links up to many other um, sites, businesses, and um, Chamber of Commerce and City of Cordova as well. Okay. Now, so what would a, I guess it, it's maybe a little, this it, with everything still kind of in the conceptual phase, this, this may be a little challenging, but what, what would either of you uh, consider to be like the typical layout of one of these? Is each one going to be different or will they, will they follow a certain form? And if they are going to be similar, what, what are the assets that are going to be there in the way of signage or AV or what anything? Glad you asked. So yeah. one of the, one of the goals is to create sites that are usable for all mobility levels. So a level area where people, um, families with strollers or elders with walkers or wheelchairs would be able to access to get under the site. And um, out at 22 Mile, there's one that we've been using as an example. And then also there are some images on that site that will show you one from Juno that we really love. And um, it has a little bit of rock work, a covered space and and room for a little bit larger space for people to have a larger gathering. And um, so they're all going to be similar in design, but yes, each site will be a little bit different because of the topography. And the one at the breakwater will be an elongated version from the one that is out at 22 mile. That's kind of an example. And we have been able to get some of the uh, building plans and specs from the Forest Service. And we hope to build to a very high standard that will require very minimal maintenance over the years. Mm-hmm. And then, Dottie, what about, have you guys talked about signage or artwork at these sites or sort of how they'll look? Um, well, de- definitely there'll be uh, opportunities um, to have, um, we've talked about it, but it, it hasn't, I mean, we're still in the development stages of it, but there will be there opportunities to have uh you know, uh, those different aspects of natural history, local history, indigenous uh, history, and uh, for even storytelling to take place. Also, 
as visual sites for artists where even how the uh, they're placed in such a way that there would be view sites that would be taking in optimal views for you know painting as well and artwork so like taking in all those different components there would be signage that would be able to um, have have it be so that each spot is also an educational opportunity and like what she was talking about with accessibility for you know just the range of ages from babies and strollers all the way to you know people that are in, in wheelchairs and have mobility uh, issues that that would be so all ages would be uh, uh, included good good all right well so who <clears throat> Natasha this may be a question for you or either of you who all is kind of involved in terms of people and and agencies do you have a board or do you have a collective group of of different entities i know you mentioned the forest service that 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 so who comprises this effort so we've been working with multiple um different um agencies we're working right now with the city in regards to um the breakwater trailhead site and the um City manager has been helpful with that. We're also working with Parks and Rec, um, with Duncan at Parks and Rec, and then also with the Cordova Trails Committee. We're involved with them. And through that, we've had some um, help from the um, group that came in that we're helping guide that Cordova Trails. They helped, uh, they they gave us access to some of their professional uh staff to evaluate the project and who was that the, the an architecture uh national parks national park service is helping through cordova trails with design work and they brought in architects two different architects and we went through a planning uh session last spring to do some some of the hard work of design and that will be coming out fairly soon for people to be able to visualize some of these things that we've we're planning. Okay, good. And talking about like each spot connects a different agency because of who whoever the land is connected to. And it's really something that connects a lot of existing agencies, whether it's the Historical Society or um, NBE or, or the City of Cordova, Parks and Recs, all the Forest Service. It actually connects a lot of different agencies in um, creating this community project. Yeah, I was going to ask about the tribal entities. Have they? Do, are they on board? Do they seem eager to be able to share their story and, and be a part of this? Yes, we've actually been working with Native Village of EAC and EAC Corp. And one of the sites that have been proposed, uh, we've worked on a large grant for the Hartney Bay area. And we're waiting to hear back from DOT in regards to that grant and what will happen with that. And yes, we've worked very closely with Native Village of EAC and EAC Corporation in regards to that particular site, but also with Native Village of EAC on the interpretive signage that Dottie was men mentioning for educational purposes to help people at each site to learn something and to spur connection to the land that they're actually sitting on and the things that they're looking around at while they're at each of these sites to help create a better connect connection sure. to yeah. the natural world. Well, in a better sense of how the area that they're in fits into the different layers of how things have changed. I mean, you think about not that this is part of it, but, you know, say, for example, there was one that was connected to the to the Copper River Highway and Here's how it looked when it was the rail. We've all seen these pictures, of course, in local books. This is what it was like when it was the railroad, and then it became this, and then, you know, it turned into this, and then the earthquake happened and it changed. And, you know, that ability to see an area from a number of different perspectives is is always fascinating. So, Like a living history type of a thing, too, an outdoor museum, and also just being respectful to the lands and um, in that 
that way. Just yeah. the the um, historical ownership of the land and being able to uh, pay tribute and be um, give respect and honor to those um, and an opportunity for um, educational, you know, uh, information to be be to be put out there in an outdoor museum sort of sure. way. Sure. And very much, a, it sounds like a living museum from the sound of things, because it's obviously the type of thing that can evolve as new information becomes available or uh, mm-hmm. or as if, if other sites are added. So as far as where it's at now, um, you know, if you say, you say we've got people that are like, yeah, okay, this is, this is something I can really get behind. I think the town needs this. I want to participate. Um, you said that you're in a fundraising mode, obviously, right now. Are you, and that you have access to some grants? Um, is this one of these situations where we're hoping to be able to that the local contributions will be leveraging additional dollars, or is it is it more that that we're really going to try to fund this ourselves directly for the benefit of ourselves? What you just said is exactly what we're trying to do. We've learned over the course of the last year or so that by creating community involvement and having community members want to be a part of the project by either volunteering or maybe both volunteering and donating, we can leverage those funds through funders, uh, through grants to help pay for these different spaces. Um, And right now what we're doing is we, if you look at that site, you'll see that we have got lots and lots of community members who are in support of the project. And one of the great things that happened this spring is along the route, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bay to Bay event that is a run, bike, walk, run that goes from Hartney Bay all the way to Orca. The proceeds from that particular event actually were all donated to this particular project this year. And so quite a few people who um, are, were involved in that event were actually donating their money by by attending the event and participating mm-hmm. and then also we've got another <clears throat> another couple of fundraising raising opportunities that are happening uh the reluctant fisherman restaurant they i don't know if you remember but sylvia lang started what's called the heart wall years ago which local artists could show their work now the new owners of the reluctant fisherman wanted to breathe new life into the heart wall and they asked if we would uh, get artists to show their work. And we agreed to do it as long as 50% of the proceeds from the sales of the art pieces go to the court of covered spaces and 50% go to the artists who are exhibiting their work. And we've had several artists up right so far. We started in late April and David Rosenthal, he was the first one up. Now Emily Rubio's art is up. Next up is Paula Payne, and we've been able to um, raise funds from that, and more um, artists are coming up every 60 days to raise funds. And then also, if you look on the website, you'll see that there's a spot where you can make an individual donation, and it's really simple to do. And every little bit of uh, donation money that comes in will help us leverage for getting grant monies to grow the funds to make these sites a reality. Good. Anything to add to that, Donnie? Just that um, the uh, the funds are channeled through the um, Cordova um, Historical um, Society. Oh. So that's how we they acted as um, an agency that where the, um, the funds get put through them. So it's not just in a small. Right private fund or anything. So they're all, yeah, they're all set up for, for doing that's right in their wheelhouse. So that's great. Um, any other events on the horizon, uh, as far as community fundraisers, you had something at one point scheduled for the 30th. I don't, did, did that happen? The, the celebration event? We postponed that event until mid August Ah. because what we'd like to do, we've been working with the city to create the visual, representation of what will happen at the breakwater 
And we're hoping to be able to delineate the little parklet that's being created there so that when people come in mid-August, we don't quite have the date yet. We had to push it forward just a bit. Um, but we'll be doing a celebration there in mid-August and we'll be sending out information in regards to that very soon so that we can have that celebration in August, but people will also be able to see exactly what's going to be happening there at the same time. Good. And I, I saw in the, the information that, that you sent me before we began our conversation that you have a $30,000 goal. Uh, and back in, I, let's see, I guess it'd be about two weeks ago, you were about a third of that. Is, is that still about where you are or is, has there been more progress since? There's been a little bit more progress. I would say we're over a third okay. um, at this point, and um, we're still hoping to raise that 30000 by the end of August. Okay, I was going to ask, that was my next question, is is there sort of any sort of a time-sensitive deadline? Like if we, if we don't have that sort of seed money that proves to larger funders that the community interest is there, that we end up missing a window for, for important grants or other opportunities? That's a possibility. So that's why we do have the deadline by the end of mm -hmm. August. So we're hoping, we're really hoping that people will step up and try to make their donations before the end of August. And yes, it, it's definitely important because then we can show that there we have made the effort and that the community is ready for this and they're all, and people want to see it happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, anything else now, um, you know, as far as the project, I think we've, we've gone over a lot of the basics, but we've still got some time here. If there, if there are other aspects of it, maybe interesting thoughts that people have shared with you about what it would mean to them or, or other details or other visions. In my experience, pretty much everybody says, I don't know why this hasn't happened before now. <laughs> especially given the volume of precipitation. Mm -hmm. So you would say it seems like the, the excitement has been there. Dottie, have you seen that? You know, people that, it, as you've explained it to them, they get pretty enthusiastic. Um, I, I think one thing I just want to mention, every contribution is welcome. Any size, mm. anything that anybody wants to put in towards it is welcome. It, it's, uh, we appreciate every every bit. and, and um, But also just that, I think that everyone who hears about it, uh, you know, there's a different appeal and it, it, like whether it's thinking about, oh, it would be so great to, um, you know, it could be perfect for a birthday party. It would be perfect for just, I mean, there's so, so many different usages of, of, um, of it that each person that hears about the project, it brings up another conversation and another way that, that it would be appreciated. And um, so, you know, I think it's a, would be a really positive element within our community. And even just hearing about Natasha, sometimes talking about her mom and wanting to get her mom out and just having to just sit in the car mm. and versus being able to go someplace where she could have it be accessible and she could still be outside and sit at the table and have a picnic and get, get some fresh air and, you know, just that on its own is just, a, it to me, gives a wonderful picture of the usage of, of these spots. Yeah, well, you think about all the memories that, that could be created and, and, again, having those spaces to enjoy being outside without having to be in the weather, without having to be stuck in the car. Uh, you know, it just seems like there's a lot of potential. And, and, and Natasha, you mentioned, you know, can't believe it, there's sort of a sense of, I can't believe it's finally, somebody's finally doing this. Why didn't they do it a long time ago? Any other interesting thoughts that have been shared with you from people as you've told them about it? Anything that stands out? Yes, I, I have heard numerous times that people feel that it will definitely benefit mental health. Mm -hmm. um, in Cordova, we're, well, we're very lucky now that we have the Cordova Center. It's yeah. such a wonderful space for Cordovans just mm -hmm. being able to walk into that building and um, spend time in the library or the museum or to go to a meeting. It's such a benefit to Cordova. And I think this will just enhance what we've already got and, mm -hmm. and make those places where people can go when they need five minutes in nature to recharge or to sit with a friend and have a cup of coffee. 
I think that um, the mental health aspect is huge. Yeah. yeah. And I've and I've heard that from people numerous times. Mm -hmm. You too, Dottie. You seem to have heard some stories like that. I agreed with that. I think that being outside and especially we are so fortunate for the natural environment that we're in to be able to be outside and have that time to allow nature to heal all the parts of us that sometimes we just need that that time outside fresh air yeah. and uh just have the views uh restore us yeah well let's go then to kind of final thoughts then as we wrap up here um what do you Dottie, we'll start with you what do you want to leave us with uh well i know that we're coming up to some deadlines that are really really important and i um, I feel like if somebody's thought about, you know, making a contribution or connecting with us, you know, uh, and wanting to be a part of the project, uh, now is a really good time because we're coming up now as the ideas have be become more solidified. If someone's been thinking about contributing, now would be a really great time to do that so we can go forward and get the the uh, leverage you know, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, those funds with agencies that might be able to really um, help make these become a reality. Yeah, because every dollar, you know, when you're doing that, then every dollar becomes two or three mm -hmm. or four. You know, if you if the basic if the local seed money enables you to get three or four different grants, then basically, you, you know, exactly. you can't because you can't get those other grants if there isn't the show of local community support. It's a lot like what we used to talk about with Kathy Sherman when the, when the Cordova center was coming together, it's critical mm -hmm. that, that the funders really want to see that what they're going to, that what they're investing in matters. And I would think yeah. too, that, that sharing, you know, as, as this website gets out there, that if people can use all their different ways of sharing stuff, the social media, you know, to communicate with people uh, who love Cordova, but are not, in town that that would like to see this the next time they come to town or something i mean i can think of a bunch of families right off the top of my head so sharing mm -hmm. that information around too would be another helpful thing that that people can uh natasha what do you think in terms of final thoughts here well what dotty said is very important we need community members to make a donation to the project so that we can then leverage that money and also stay tuned, um, go ahead and sign up or give us your email address or let us know when you see us that you'd like to be a part of the project and we, cause we could use all the help we can get and attend, um, pay attention so that when uh, we do our celebration in August, uh, toward the middle of August, come and join us and, and help your, bring your friends to mm -hmm. help grow the project. Sure. Yeah. And you mentioned the need for volunteers too. What uh, what are some of the things that people could do if they wanted to to donate some time? Well, actually we've had different events where like at Shorebird, we set up a table so that we could help educate people about the project and numerous volunteers were helpful with that and we'll continue to do that type of thing so that people who maybe haven't heard Mm -hmm. about the project can ask questions or become involved so that's one way they can volunteer we will be doing some kind of community volunteer efforts as we actually construct the sites it might be there might, there's a, a large variety of things that will need to be done so there will be many opportunities to assist in the actual construction for example dave zastro with parks and rec he's been super helpful with um the design phases that we've gone through so far. The Cordova Trails Committee um, members, they've been really great with their efforts in sharing knowledge. So there's there's tons of ways people can volunteer. Okay, good. Well, and again, that website, visit cordovaalaska.org, and then look for a link for covered spaces. That'll have a lot more information. Uh, we'll put those links in the in the description of the YouTube version of this show, which will get uploaded after it actually airs. And I really want to thank the both of you for the invitation for us to be a part of this. You know, we love sharing information like that, especially Dottie and and Natasha, as you both said. If it if it means more smiles on more faces, then yeah, <laughs> we're definitely behind that. So thanks thanks to both of you for your efforts and and for reaching out so we could chat about it today. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Natasha Cassiano, Dottie Woodman, discussing the Cordova Trail and Covered Spaces Project. That web address again, visit cordovaalaska.org, and then look for the Covered Spaces link. Those of you who are maybe catching this program on demand on YouTube after it's been on the radio, we have a direct link right down in the description, so you can grab that there. And for any of you listening on the radio, this program will go up on uh, Cordova TV, which is youtube.com slash Cordova TV. So if you came in in the middle of it or you want to hear it again or you can think of someone who might enjoy hearing it or if you want to put a link to this to that show on your social media and let people all around. I mean, because I because obviously there are a lot of people that maybe have moved and would still like to help Cordova see that this project gets done. So you're more than welcome to send out a link. As always, our program here is brought to you by Cordova Wireless Communications. We appreciate that a lot, given how much local focus they have, not to mention the dollars that they bring in from outside when working together with Cordova Telephone Cooperative to the tune of over $10 million a year, which isn't something that we have to go catch in our nets or produce in any way. It just comes by virtue of having the type of communications company that Cordova Wireless and CTC are. They have backed us in this effort for many, many years. Of course, this is an on-demand program, so if you are interested in being a guest or suggesting a guest, we always encourage you to do that. Just reach out and let us know. The rest of your programming, to which you are entitled in the 10 a.m. hour, is on the way. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time for Town Meeting on KLAM.